Hey! Angular signals are great for managing state and reactivity since version 16. But forms? That's where things always felt a little, uh, unfinished. Not anymore. With Angular version 21, signal forms are here. Signal forms make form handling easier, cleaner, and way more fun. In this video, we take a first look at building signal-based forms, including validation. Let's jump in. The first step to using signal forms is to create a signal for our form. The signal holds the data for each field on the form. That signal becomes the sole source of truth for all form values, making the form predictable and reactive. Here's my Star Wars Vehicle Sales sample application. We want a form for the user to subscribe to our newsletter. What data fields does our form need? Our subscription form includes first and last name, email address, and number of years as a Star Wars fan, so our signal should include each of these fields. Going back to the code, for full type safety, we define an interface describing each field. I'll create a TypeScript file. Since we're working with subscription data, I'll name the file subscription.ts. You could append data or form data to this name for added clarity. I'll close Explorer. In this file, we create the interface detailing the fields on the form. Export Interface Subscription. We add each of our form fields, email as string, first name as string, last name as string, and years as fan is a number. Each field in this interface will be associated with a control on our form. As you create this interface, keep in mind that each field's data type must be compatible with the HTML control that will display it. So fields displayed in a text box have a string data type. The years as a fan uses a number type text box, so it's numeric. Also, we can't define fields in the interface as optional. And in this example, we can't define a type as null because a native input element doesn't directly support null. Our subscription form fields are basically flat, but they don't have to be. We could have a nested structure, like this. And we can include an array, like this. If there's interest, I can cover examples of more complex signal structures in later videos. I'll undo this and stick with our flat structure. This interface details the data structure for our form's signal. Now we're ready to declare that signal. We'll do that in the component. I've already created the component for this subscribe form, but it doesn't yet have any code. Declare a variable for the form's signal. I'll name it subscribe model equals signal. We use our interface to define its type. A signal must always have an initial value. The subscription interface defines an object, so we need an object with an initial value for each field. We could define that here. First name is initially empty, last name is initially empty, and so on. But for good separation, let's instead define our initial values in the same file that we defined the interface, subscription.ts. Declare and export a constant. I'll name it initial data and set its type to subscription. Define a subscription object and set the string fields to an empty string, email, first name, and last name. We set our numeric field to NAN, or not a number. By using NAN instead of zero as our default, we can tell if the user entered zero as their response. Note that Angular excludes any field with an initial value of undefined when creating the form. OK, we'll use this constant when initializing or resetting the form to its initial values. Going back to the component, set the initial signal value to our constant, initial data. Think of this signal as the form data model. It holds the structure and initial data for the form. To see when the signal value changes, let's add an effect. EFF equals effect. In the arrow function, console.log the email field using this dot subscribe model. 
Since subscribe model is a signal, use parentheses to read the value of the signal, then dot email. This logs the email field value every time the subscribe model signal changes. Now that we have the form signal, we're ready to declare the form. I'll name it subscribe form. Call the form function and pass in the form signal. This creates a form wrapped around that form signal. Forms don't maintain their own data. Rather, they use the passed in signal. If the signal changes, the form automatically reflects those changes. And when the user interacts with the form controls, the signal updates automatically. Cool! Hovering over subscribe form, we see that the form is represented as a field tree. Think of the field tree as an object structure that matches our form signal. It contains the form, any field group, and all of the form fields. How about a picture? Here is the interface for our signal. We create a form like this. Then the field tree might look something like this. Our form is at the top. There is a node for each field, and each field is itself another field tree. Navigate the tree using dot notation, such as subform.email. As another example, if we had a signal with a field group like this address, the field tree would look like this. We access the city using subform.address.city. Let's go back to the code. We now have our form signal and a form wrapping that signal. Our subscribe form is not yet associated with the elements in our template. Each HTML form control must be associated with one field from our form. We do that with the field directive. In the component decorator, add an import for the field directive. Make note of this form name because we'll bind our HTML controls to this form's fields. Here is the subscribe-form.html file. I've already created the template. For each form control, add the field directive and bind the control to a field in the subscribe form. Let's start with the first name input element. Specify the field directive and bind it to subscribeform.firstName. Done! Scroll down and do the same with the last name field. Scrolling down further, for the email field, we have the required and min length attributes on the input element. Add the field directive and bind it to subscribeform.email. Notice that we see syntax errors. Setting the required attribute is not allowed on nodes using the field directive, so let's remove those attributes. Moving on to the years as a fan, set the field directive to subscribeform.yearsasfan. Notice that the min and max attributes now have a similar error. Let's delete those attributes. With that, each of our form controls are bound to an appropriate field in the subscribe form. That means that as a user types into any of these controls, the entered value is automatically assigned to the form model. Since the form model is a signal, we can react to those changes. I already have this application running, so to try it out, I'll bring up the browser. Open the console to view our logging. Display the form. Type in an email address, and we see the value of the form model signal in the console. We can react to those changes as needed. Excellent! But what about validation? Most forms require some type of validation. In our example, we've marked email as a required field. Plus, it must be a valid email address and longer than six characters. We'll also validate that the years as a fan is greater than or equal to zero and less than 100. Going back to the code, Let's declare our validation rules in the same file as our form model interface, subscription.ts. With signal forms, we add logic to our form using a schema that includes validation rules. To see what I mean, declare and export a constant. I'll name it subscription schema, then call the schema function. Use the generic argument to identify the form signal interface, in our case, subscription. Then pass in a function that returns an object with our desired logic. I'll scroll down for more space. 
The arrow function takes in the schema root path. This is an object that represents the root location in the forms field tree. From this root, we can use dot notation to access the location of a form field. We can then bind logic to a specific part of the field tree before the creation of the form. Note that these path objects don't hold values. They are addresses for locating a field in the field tree. The schema function returns an object with a set of functions defining the logic for our fields. That logic can include validators. Angular provides several validators. Let's use the required validator for the email address. In the required function, we pass in the schema path to the email field, rootpath.email, and optionally define our validation error message. I'll paste that in. Next, we validate that the email address is a valid email, so use the email validator. Again, pass in the schema path to the email field, and add a validator error message. Let's also define a min-length validator, rootpath.email, then we specify the minimum length, let's say 6, and our validation message. For the years as a fan, we'll call the min validator. We pass in the schema path, rootpath.yearsasafan, and the minimum value, then define that validation error message. Lastly, we use the max validator. We pass in the path and the maximum value. I'll again paste the error message. So we declaratively bind validation rules to fields using the schema path. That way our form knows which validation rules go with which fields and where to attach errors in the field tree. But these logic rules can be more than validation. We can define rules for disabling or hiding a control, for example. There is so much more to the signal form's validation features, including cross-field validation, custom validators, and async validation. Plus, we can add a when clause for a conditional validator. And we can use value of and state of functions to access field values or state. If these features are of interest, I'll cover these topics in later videos. With signal forms, we can have our form signal interface, initial field values, and our schema with the validation rules and logic all in one place. Or we can divide it into separate logical units or add it all to the component, whatever makes sense for our application. Sweet! Now let's add this schema to our form. In the subscribe form component, pass the schema in as the second argument to the form function. Now our field tree includes our schema logic. Before we can try this out, we need the HTML elements to display validation errors. For that, we need to check the interaction state of the field and read any error values. How do we do that? Recall that our subscribe form is represented as a field tree. Each control is a node in that tree and is also a field tree. This field tree structure matches our form signal. To access real-time information about the form or its controls, Call the field tree node as a function. Calling a field tree node as a function returns a field state object for that node. The field state object provides the interaction state, validation errors, visibility, and current field values as signals. This is a signal form, so I guess that shouldn't be a surprise. We use the field tree to navigate the form hierarchy and to bind our input elements. We use the field state to read the signals containing the real-time state. Let's look at a few examples. If we want all of the form field values, we call the form's field tree as a function to access the field state and read the value signal. To disable the submit button if the form is invalid, we call the form's field tree and read the invalid signal. In the template, we bind an input element to a field in the field tree using the path to that field. Notice that there are no parentheses here. Conditionally display elements based on a field's validation state by referencing the path to the field, 
calling the field's field tree as a function to access the field state and reading the invalid signal. Display the errors for a field by referencing the path to the field, calling the field's field tree, and reading the errors signal. Now let's add validation messages to our template. In the template, we'll add messages for the two fields we are validating, email and years as a fan. Let's start with the email. I'll paste the code and we'll talk through it. We first use an if block to determine whether we need to display the validation message. We access the subscribe form, which points to the root of the field tree. Then access the email field tree. We call this field tree as a function to get the field state. From that, we access the interaction state. The state is a signal, so we use parentheses to read that signal. Notice that we are checking invalid and touched. That way, when the user first brings up the form, the error messages won't appear until the user touches the text box. Then we loop through the array of validation errors. Because we can have multiple validation rules for a single field, we could have multiple error messages. To be complete, we add similar code to the years as fan. Want to see this in action? Bring up the form, enter an invalid email, and we see our messages. Enter a number over 100, and we see that validation message. It works, yay! If you are using signals, signal forms is the way to go. But note that as of this recording, signal forms is experimental and could change before it becomes a stable part of Angular. What do you think of signal forms? Would you like more videos on signal form features? Drop a comment below with your thoughts or questions. Thanks for watching. If this video was useful, please like and subscribe.